start with, I can't think of a better place to start this than um, one of the people that was there at the beginning. When Alan um, started to form this, you know, they came to us, two sort of battling organizations in the late 70s, had tried a couple um, times to have a pride parade and then there was a conflict and they sort of splintered apart and one saw this vision and another saw that vision and neither one came to fruition. So in fear of losing it at a time when it was important that we had and established our own pride, they came to the Dallas Tavern Guild as a organized body and asked if they would produce the Pride Parade. And of course the executive director back then was Mr. Alan Ross. And yeah, we know what, um, once Alan made up his mind to do something, there was just no question. It was maybe a matter of how long. It took us five years to get uh, a, the very first AIDS memorial in the state at Lee Park with the planting of a tree for all of those that we had lost in the early years to AIDS and HIV. And it now also has a marker in uh, Alan's name in the new side of the park over there on the Lemon Avenue side. If you're down Lee Park, go visit it. And they planted him and his tree and surrounded him with daffodils, which was his favorite flower. So it's, it's a pretty cool place to go and reflect on how it all came to be. But when he decided he couldn't do it all himself, and for a time he thought he could, uh, he reached out to a couple of people, one of those being Mr. Paul Lewis, um, who we lost unfortunately this past year. Um, he was sort of like the face of the parade and uh, back in the days when the park was just a rally really and had yet grown into being a full grown festival with food and entertainment and booths and vendors and all that. Uh, he went to a young lady named Kathy Jack. And as you learn within the Pride family, uh, if you have a spouse, uh, then they are unofficially hired too. So everybody works on parade weekend. So Susie was pulled into it, but for many, many, many years, they made the whole thing at the festival and turned it into what it's grown into now uh, down in uh, Lee Park. But uh, that's enough about how it all came to be. Uh, we're going to let you, you listen to her tell you her vision and her memories of those days and those years, the early years of Pride in Dallas. So please welcome, if you would, our first speaker tonight, Miss Kathy Jack. Oh, no, 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 you, no you're, you're not getting off that easy. I'll be back. <laughs> I say he could have just kept going. He did my whole second page of my speech. <laughs> How are you guys doing tonight? I hope well. Four days before Pride, we're all still here and we're st all still excited. Maybe not as excited as when I was about 25 years old, but it's okay. I still got it going on. I got my pride shirt waiting for me at home. First of all, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be in the company of such an inspirational men and women of our community. Many I've worked with in some capacity, capacity and many I've watched grow into community leaders, heads of Oak Lawn Counseling Center, Oak Lawn Counseling Services, Resource Center. I was here when C.C. Cox spoke. Lori Masters was here a few months back. That was amazing hearing her stories, although she had to edit almost every story she told. <laughs> when Mike Grossman asked me to speak, he gave me a choice of topics. He told me September was going to be about gay pride, and of course, in my background with the parade, I jumped at the chance to talk about what gay pride means to me. Well, I can start back when I was just a little tomboy, which is kind of like two weeks ago. <laughs> Who thought I was the only one? I thought I was the only one with these feelings and not fitting in anywhere, not in school, not on the playground. 
I just didn't fit in. I didn't feel right. The problem was I grew up, but I was still that same tomboy. And then I met someone just like me. I don't know where she came from, but she was just like me. She was 14, 15, 16 years old, and she dressed like me and talked like me, and I, I just thought that was like, oh my God, I finally found one person. Well, we became fast friends, naturally. So one day, she took me to this place over at Knox and McKinney. For those of you, maybe, in the audience that might remember back that far, it was called the conference room. If you remember, hold up your hands. If you were there, hold up your hands. All right. So you're going to know. Well, I was only 12. No, I'm just kidding. I wasn't 12. I was, yeah, I was too young to be in there, though. Um, it's now a very popular Mexican restaurant, and I'll get back to that in a minute. But we were too much, too young to be in there, but it didn't seem to matter back then because they didn't really care how old you were. They were more worried about the police coming in and raiding the bar. They had one of those red lights at the front door that would, they'd flip a switch if they saw the police coming anywhere near them. And the door person would sit there all night long on look, on, on watch for any police car or police on foot coming anywhere near the bar. It wasn't for the protection, but if the police showed up, the red light would go on and everyone would separate and the young ones like me and my friend ran to the bathroom, climbed up on top of the ledge and out the window and ran as fast as we could to our cars. Remember that? I got a lot of skinned up knees that way, I can't even tell you. But back in the 70s, you couldn't, if you were in the bars, and a lot of people may or may not know this that are sitting here today, back in the 70s, you couldn't be caught holding hands and you certainly couldn't be caught dancing or you would be immediately arrested and jailed for indecency. And you guys, Jack and George, you know that to be a fact. Not that that happened to you, but you were there. As bad as all that was, I was so proud because I finally found people just like me that just wanted a place to be themselves. Gay pride. I found it. I sure did. It might not have been the best, but that's what we had at the time. Shortly then after, there was a bar right down the street, right on the end of Cedar Springs and Inwood called the High Country. More people remember that. We had a lot of good times at the High Country. And that was, that was my very first Pride Parade that I ever, I, I think there were, I, I want to say there were 16 entries. It was huge. Huge. We got a trailer and some hay bales and all piled in. I had on a satin western shirt. I was studly. We went from Wycliffe and Cedar Springs to Oak Lawn. That was it. That was our big parade route. Then we all piled out, walked all the way back to high country. Don't know what happened to the trailer. Happy Gay Pride! I think there were about maybe 50 people on the street, but those that were out were very happy to be there. And for once, we felt like we could actually be out in public and not be ridiculed by the police department, by the city of Dallas, and by the people that live around here. So that was a great day for me. In 1982, I managed my first bar. It was so exciting. A lesbian bar so big and beautiful and so full of beautiful women. Unfortunately, it didn't last very long. And once again, it turned into a Mexican food restaurant. <laughs> There's a joke in this somewhere, but I'm not going to tell it. Anyway, the Unicorn was the first huge lesbian bar in Dallas, Texas. And I was so glad to be a part of it. 
What a great time that was. I just didn't understand why the women had their bars and the men had theirs. Can't we play together? Can't we fight together? It only makes sense that this fight for our rights would be better fought if we stood together in the same room instead of apart, right? It just never made sense for me. It got so bad that some of the bars went so far as to post signs that stated no open-toed shoes. Well, we knew who that targeted. Chris, you weren't coming in in your flip-flops. And all women must wear dress or skirt for entry into the bar. Well, I wasn't going there. I didn't own, as I still don't, I didn't own any skirts or dresses. But my, <laughs> when uh, Lori found out, Lori Masters found out about these signs, she called me immediately. She said, <laughs> she told me to find three friends and three skirts and meet her outside the bar. <laughs> that was not going to be pretty. Together we approached the entrance to find the signs were taken down, which was very disappointing because we were looking so forward to walking through those doors. We still went in and ordered drinks, and what a pretty sight. Six big old butch women in prairie skirts and boots, and right in the middle of all of us, there stands Lori in all her beauty. That was lesbian pride, ladies and gentlemen. Things were really changing fast in the 80s. Unfortunately, HIV AIDS epidemic changed everything. Not necessarily in a good way, obviously. But as bad as it was, it finally brought our community together. We decided that the only way to fight this horrible thing was to fight together. We raised thousands of dollars doing all kinds of benefits. And I mean, when I say all kinds of benefits, all kinds. I remember a time I was face down doing a mud wrestling contest in a dog pool of dog food, wet. But we raised a lot of money. And it didn't matter at the time because it was for a good cause. But we raised thousands of dollars doing bake sales, garage sales, drag shows, and that's true gay pride. Finally, all for one, and one for all. In 1986, I came to Cabin Enterprises looking for a job. I filled out my application and waited for my phone to ring. I knew I was in. I had done all these other things in Dallas. I waited, I waited. I waited some more. Well, at the time, what I didn't know is they only had one working in, one woman working in the entire company, and she worked at the old plantation. A woman by the name of Chris Bingston, who I know you all know and love. So I thought, well, you know, I don't know Chris Bingston, but I'm sure we'll get along really well. But not so fast. I was a lesbian, she wasn't. There's a difference back in the 80s. So, the lesbian working in a men's bar? No, wasn't gonna happen. Faces were cracking all over the place. No, 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 no. Finally, Paul Lewis, the general manager of the old plantation, gave me a shot. He said, I'll give you a chance, you can work the door. I didn't care. I said, I'll even, you got a place on the dance floor that needs to be repaired, I'll repair it. I didn't care. All I needed was a job. And I was going to make it work. Chris and I were the only two women working in this bar full of 20 men. And we worked it. And talk about woman power and pride. That was the two of us. Paul 
came up to me months later and asked if I was interested in volunteering for the gay pride parade. I said, sure. Not knowing what I had agreed to. I just, just that year, sure. Well, I had a meeting with Paul and Alan Ross, who at the time was the executive director of the Tavern Guild. And I had met Alan before that day, but never had the pleasure of working with him. He was such the sweet man. For those of you that knew him, he had such a sweet, soft, kind voice. But he had a fight in him. <laughs> He's like a dog with a bone. He's not going to give up. And I really can't remember a battle that he didn't win. Alan was the parade coordinator, but he did it all, never asking for any help. And for those of you in the room that don't know that much about the parade, it was hard to fathom how one man could do even what Paul and I eventually did do. I still don't believe it to this day, but I, I can believe it because it was Alan Ross. He, uh, he did it all, never asking for any help. He allowed Paul and me, <laughs> just one year, he allowed Paul and me to put out the numbers on, on, for the floats. Really tough job. Of course, he wouldn't let us go do it ourselves. He had to supervise us. He rolled around in a little cart, a little golf cart. Every time we'd put a number down, he had to check it off his list. But that was Alan. I guess we did a good job for him because he asked us back for the next year and the following years. And eventually Paul and I started taking on more parade responsibility due to Alan's failing health. Each year with the help of the Dallas Tavern Guild, we would help organize one of the fastest growing gay pride parades in the country. Every year it kept getting better and more challenging, bigger, but oh so rewarding. The people, the music, the laughter, it was just a high that I can never, ever convey to anyone unless you're standing right in the middle of it. Truly amazing. It's like gay pride on steroids. In 1995, we lost our mentor, Alan, who fought as long as he could, but finally lost his battle to AIDS. Appropriately, the Dallas Tavern Guild voted unanimously in 1996 to re rename the Pride Parade to the Dallas, or to the Alan Ross Texas Freedom Parade. Every year, we joke that we always have the sun in our faces because it's Alan smiling on us. I just wish he'd do something about that incredible heat. Maybe this Sunday, Alan. Just maybe this Sunday. Paul Lewis and I contributed uh, to, uh, and co to coordinate the parade for the next 10 years until it became too large for the two of us to manage. It has become one of the largest pride parades in our nation under the watchful eye of the president executive director and of the Dallas Tavern Guild, my friend and partner in crime, Michael Doman. Congratulations, Michael. Michael and I had a great couple of years back in 2005 and 2006 when, incredibly, I was elected the first female president of the Dallas Tavern Guild. And I wouldn't, have done, had, I wouldn't have done that had Michael not pushed me and pushed me and pushed me and pushed me. But you know, it was the best time of my life. I had a great time. He kept me going to charity events, dinners, Voice of Pride competitions, and so many community events. What a ride, man. I was going all the time. When I finished my term in 2006, I wasn't sure if I needed to go to, to a spa for a big rest or just go to rehab. <laughs> I voted on spa. Rehab may come later. In 2006, I left Cavan after 20 years of a long family life with this company. And I thought, you know, this has been the best 20 years anybody could hope for. I've done everything. I've seen everything. 
I've worked with some of the best people I've ever worked with. I have a huge cabin family. I've developed so many lifelong friendships. I finally settled, I finally settled down with what I'm convinced is the best woman in the world, Susie Buck. Then I thought I would find something that was as fulfilling as what I've been doing. Well, I was wrong. After eight years of soul searching for what I wanted to do, what did I do? I came back to Cavan Family and I manage a place we opened back in 1989. I'm back at Sue Ellen's. I have to share with you the day of the Marriage Equality Act the day that came down from the Supreme Court. Being at that bar on, the, on June 26 was one of the happiest days of my life. Everything I'd been hoping for all my gay life came that day. Everyone, men, women, straight people, gay people, transgender people, bisexual people, all in the same building, laughing, crying for joy, celebrating the Supreme Court ruling on the marriage equality. That is the new meaning of gay pride. And if, if you ask anyone who knows me, I've been telling everyone, I'll never see that in my lifetime. Anytime somebody would say, what do you think? I said, it's going to happen. It's just not going to happen in my lifetime. Well, I am so happy to be so stupidly wrong. I'm not going to lie. It has its challenges being in that bar. I'm not used to being the oldest person in there. Uh -huh. These women can truly be my daughters, and some of them even granddaughters. But what's great to see are all these young faces taking full advantage of all the rights that we fought for so hard. Everyone in this room, we've all done it. Like every equal rights movement, there will be those who walk up and say, thank you for what you did for all of us. Then there are those who just take it for granted. But we didn't do it for this, the fight. We didn't do the fight for the thank yous. We fought because it was the right thing to do. And it was the right thing for us. And we can look down the way 20 years from now and go, I'm really glad we did that. I am so proud of myself and everyone in here and all those that came before me for what we've done for those that came after us. Thank you so much. I just want to take a second and say that uh, the Dallas Tavern Guild voted to dedicate this year's parade to Paul Lewis, who Without Paul, as you know, I wouldn't have had a job. Although he did get me into the parade, so that kind of, you know, no. No, I, I, uh, he was my protector, my dear friend, the love of my life until I met Susie. Uh, for those of you that didn't know him, you missed a gem of a man. There's not another person on this earth like him. Most importantly, I want to thank the Dallas Way. What a great organization. Thank you, Jack and George. It's so important to the city and to this community to have this. I want as much as I can to let all of my young people know about it so they can know what happened before they came on scene. I just want to leave you with this quote I saw this morning. Evie Lou, I just, like I said, as I was finishing my speech, at the end of our life, what really matters is not what we bought, but what we built. Not what we got, but what we shared. Not our competence, but our character. And not our success, but our significance. Oh, 
live a life that matters to all. Thank you so much for your time. Happy Pride Weekend. I love you all. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kathy Jack.